Todd, I, I have enjoyed our conversation up to this point uh, before we started rolling. Um, but just to start off with, what is your earliest memory of your family being involved in racing the way that it was? Oh, my Lord. Um, part of my problem right now is my memory. Okay. Too many concussions. I can tell you things. Some of them I don't remember. Some of them I remember because I've been told. But, you know, that particular question, you know, my father owned a racetrack. So I grew up every Saturday we were at the racetrack. And, you know, I'd wake up Saturday morning and mom would be cooking sausage and peppers and big pot for the racetrack. And uh, in the afternoon I'd start watching Wide World of Sports and have some hamburg or whatever she was making and we'd load it all up and go to the racetrack so you know i i grew up at the racetrack so my first memory of it is years and years of being there and the thing was when i grew up you know going to the racetrack was an every weekend thing so i cared i could care less about racing <laughs> as you laugh <laughs> i could literally care less about racing um me and my buddies would would run around the racetrack, you know, up and down in the grandstands and raid the candy stand and go in and get French fries out of the concession stand and just having fun, with not even watching the races. Uh, that changed when I was 11 years old. Uh, Brett had, been, had started racing street stocks, and he was keeping the car out in the garage beside the house, and him and his buddies would be out there every night working on it and, and I didn't understand why. I had no idea why these guys out here, but I'd hang out with them. I wanted to hang out with the big kids, you know. Well, one, one week, uh, Brett asked me if I wanted to go to the race with him. He was going, first time he was going to Perry, New York to race. And I said, yeah, I'll go. I've got nothing else to do. You know, I'll go with you. So, of course, I was only 11. I wasn't old enough to get in the garage here at Pitt area. So they snuck me in and... We were there racing that night and heat race and this stuff. And he goes out in the feature and he wins the race. First time he'd been there and won the race. First time I'd ever been a part of a crew. And we went out and, you know, on a racetrack and victory lane and the, the flag and a trophy and the girls and everybody cheering. And we're out there and I'm like, man, this is pretty darn <laughs> cool right here. Now I understand why they do this. I get it. I see, you know, why they work so hard every night, all week long on this race car, because this is why they, they want to <laughs> do this right here. Yeah. And from that moment on, it changed my life. Now I'm all about race cars from 11 years old on. Now, was it the trophy girl that changed your mind? Or what? <laughs> well, at that point, probably not. I was only 11, Rick, for crying out loud. But it was. I think it was just... The thrill of being out there, the accomplishment that I, even though I really had nothing to do with it, the accomplishment I felt winning the race, you know, and being part of the crew at that point. And uh, it was, that was the, that was the defining moment for me in my racing career. Now, was your goal always to drive or was maybe the mechanical side something that eventually attracted your attention? Uh, I, I think it was always to drive. I, I don't really know. Uh, that answer is a positive. Um, growing up in it and being around it my whole life, um, yeah, you want to drive. That's, you know, the, the guy behind the wheel is having the most fun. But, you know, I grew up building them, working on them, changing tires on pit road for my brother Brett and his modifieds. Um, you know, I, I didn't, you know, most guys get started in go-karts, you know, and Legends cars and all that when they're younger. My first race, I was 19 years old, and I built my own car and financed it myself, and uh, it was in Stafford Springs, Connecticut. You know, so I, I I didn't get the early racing experience, and then I went broke, and I mean it's a long story. I don't know if you want to go into all that. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm racing my own car. I ran out of money, and up in New York, and. and uh, no, in New England. Okay. Yeah, all in New England. I was racing in New England. That's where Brett was racing. And 
started driving a, a mod a full modified. That was an SK modified. Started driving a full modified for a guy, and he had no money. And I literally was going to the tire truck, getting the takeoffs from everybody, and putting them on our car. And we were racing a hundred lapper at Stafford one night, and got crashed, got spun out going into three, hit driver's side, wrapped my knee on the roll cage, and it swelled up, and the car was destroyed. And the guy said, man, I, I don't have the money to fix this thing. I am so sorry. I said, you know what, it's, it's okay, because I'm moving to North Carolina on Monday. And I went home and packed all my stuff. I had a little Chevette, packed everything I owned up in that Chevette, and I drove south and went to work for Rick Hendrick and Robert G. on the Bush cars. Now, did you know when you wrecked that you were moving to North Carolina, or was that well, a, was that a decision that was made on impact? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was kind of made on impact, but uh, you know, Jeff and Brett had Jeff had already moved down. He was racing for Rick, and Brett had moved down, uh, I believe, the year before, and he was working on the Bush cars, and that was the year that he got to drive five races for Rick. Uh, Levi Garrett car he ran five races and I think he won four of them. Yeah, something like that. It was incredible what he did that year. And Tim Richmond was also driving him then. And you know they were all down here and I, you know, I wasn't going anywhere driving a car with takeoffs on it. You know, and I knew eventually I was going to have to do it. So I was like, okay, well I'm going to go down south and I'm going to be a fabricator and I'm going to build race cars. Now, how old were you at that point? Uh, at that point, I was uh, 20, let me think, 21 or 22. Okay, all right. Yeah. Now, you graduated high school in New Franklin New County, Virginia, just north of Martinsville. Okay. So, so my how story is – How did that work? So <laughs> dad sold a racetrack yeah. okay. when I was 13. Okay. We moved to New England. Uh, just outside of Boston, that's where Jeff was racing for Dick Armstrong, the big red, big red machine number one, uh -huh. won in all the races. That was the year that he won 55 out of 78. And mom and dad went to work for, for Dick Armstrong in the Dooley factory and went to school there for two years. And then Satch Worley was building Log Cabin Speedway just north of Martinsville. And he hired dad to come down and help build it help run it because dad okay. had so much experience yeah. with racetracks. Yeah. Yeah. So then we moved to Virginia and I went two years, I went junior, senior year in Franklin County, Virginia, graduated there. And week after I graduated, I was living in, back in Connecticut with Brett. Brett had moved up there and was racing modifieds there. So that's, you were a nomad. Oh, I was a nomad. I went to three <laughs> different high schools and moved all Who over. You really? Yeah. Yeah. How, how how hard was that for you to bounce back and forth? Um, it wasn't as hard as it could have been because I had racing. Okay, yeah. And, you know, when I moved to New England, uh, I became friends with, with Rick Armstrong, who was Dick's son. And so we got to hang out with him. And he was captain of football team, captain of hockey team. So he was one of the yeah. popular guys in school. So I, I was right in there, you know, uh, moved to Virginia. And by this time I was already, and Ricky actually started to back up a little. Rick started racing. So I was a crew chief on his late model for a little while before I moved. Moved to Virginia and uh, Jeff had already made a name for himself in the South a little bit. And so people knew who Bodine was and, um, that helped a little bit. And I had some really good friends, about three guys that I became friends with that, that were racing people kind of. And, but, you know, I, I was all about racing, you know, and, and I, on the weekends I'd go to the races, we'd go watch Jeff race. Uh, during the summer, the first summer I spent down here, I went racing with Jeff uh, all over Langley and Southside and all the racetracks with, when he was driving for Manuel Siracus. So, it wasn't that bad, you know. It could have been a lot worse. I know that this is a question that you have been asked 10 million times, mm -hmm. and I apologize for asking it, but personality-wise, there are three Bodine brothers. You got Jeff, you got Brett, and then you got Todd. Um, how would you describe your personalities? Uh, <clears throat> because you are not like... Jeff and 
Brad? Well, I, I, I think that uh, personality-wise, just strictly personality, yeah, we're all different. You know, uh, Jeff's a, a good guy with a great heart, but when it came to racing, he was all business. And when when he was racing modifieds and he was in the garage or the pit area, he didn't talk to anybody else. It was about making that race car go fast, and that's why he was so so successful. I mean, heck, he won over 600 modified races. I mean, come on, that's pretty incredible. And then Brett comes along, you know, and and well, and with Jeff, it showed up on the racetrack. His personality on the racetrack, you know, no take no prisoners and go for it. And Brett comes along and and. Brett was the guy in high school that everybody loved. Didn't matter if you were a nerd in the books, if you were a jock playing sports, or one of the heads that liked to do that kind of stuff. Everybody liked Brett because just that's him. Yeah. I mean, you can you just talk to him one time and you can see it. And there again, that kind of personality flowed to the racetrack. You know, um, he was always the kind of lay back guy and calculating and, you know, work his way to the front and put himself in position and then go for it. You know, he wasn't that crash through the field, beat him up kind of guy. And then I came along and I think it sounds a little funny, but I think I was right down the middle. Uh, you know, I, I was about racing. I, it's what I always did in building race cars and setting them up, crew chief and changing tires. I was all about it. And when I started driving, um, you know, I was, I was, I like to call it uh, uh, aggressive but smart. You know, you know, try, I was always the guy that I'd, I'd push you around a little bit, you know, and I'd move you out of the way, but I wouldn't spin you out. But at the same time, I was kind of calculating, trying to figure out how to race and be smart and not put myself in bad positions. So I think I was kind of down the middle on that. Uh, and I think... In life in general, we're, we're all that same way. Now, you talked about moving down here after being involved in that wreck and everything and going to work at Hendrick as a fabricator and all that. Once you moved back down here, or once you moved to North Carolina, how much were you racing? Or did that get put on the back burner? Well, it, it didn't, and then it did because I got fired. <laughs> Uh, well, so, it is NASCAR. So. so when I moved down here, uh, Brett and Jay Hedgecock were very close friends, very good friends. Jay's a great guy. And Jay had a guy over in Durham that he had built a car for, and the guy had no driver for it. And the guy really didn't have a lot of money, but he had a complete car, and he raced it once in a while. And just, but, So Jay kind of hooked me up with this guy to go race Martinsville in the fall race, the very last race at Martinsville. So I went over and I worked on the car a little bit. and now, The Bush car? Or no, late right? model stock car. Okay, all right. I'm sorry, it was late model stock yeah. car. And we went to Martinsville, and we actually were really, really fast, except for the battery in the battery box. I'd get in the corner, and it would lean over and short out and then fall back, and I'd go down the straightaway. So <laughs> it was hit or yeah. miss, but yeah. the car was fast. And... Because of that race, a guy by the name of Danny Bumpus, Bumpus Ford in Roxborough, he had a team, and he approached me after the race about driving his car for him the next year. I was like, yeah, man, I'm all in. You kidding me? So that winter, uh, I went up to Cervacus, and, of course, I knew them all, knew Butchie and, and everybody because and, Jeff had raced there for him. And I'd spent a lot of time there. So I went up there, and I lived with Butch Savrakis for two weeks. And me and Butch built a car from the tubing rack to everything but wiring and plumbing in two weeks. A brand-new uh, Mustang. Went out and and went back to the shop with it and finished it. And, you know, that's what we were going to race the next year. And I raced 13 races for... Danny Bumpus, and we blew eight motors, and we wrecked three times. <laughs> and the other, that, how did and the other <laughs> races that we actually finished, we were in the top three. Yeah, I mean we we had speed. Yeah. Well, 
the the guy that was the crew chief on it was this little southern guy. I won't mention his name. He's he's probably passed by now though. Um, but he hated Yankees. <laughs> he hated Yankees with a passion. <laughs> So I was kind of doomed from the start with that one. And for whatever reason, he blamed me for blowing eight motors. Wasn't my fault, but, you know. And so Danny fired me. Well, you, yeah, said, so that you, was, you said he was a little southern guy like that was a bad thing. No, just a <laughs> little, little old southern redneck that just hated Yankees. Right? Can I tell you? Okay. You know, right. Truth hurts sometimes. <laughs> so Danny fired me. and. Yeah. uh uh, I was it, I was working for Rick at the time, and then from Rick's, uh, I went to work at Tiger Tom's, okay. Pistones. Uh, I built some race cars there, and I bet you I built a hundred dump cans for Tiger, and they sold them through the, the company yeah. for the business out front, the parts business, and all kinds of little gadgets, anything out of aluminum, I catch cans I was making, all kinds of stuff, and I built whole race cars while I was there. From there, you made your first bush start for him, didn't you? Well, actually, Tiger was listed as the owner, but it was actually his son Pete's car. Yeah, 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 and it was it was one in that time frame too. Okay, Uh, I was actually over to Pete's house one night, and he said, "Hey, come on now, I'll show you my old race car." And I went back in the garage, and there it was. I said, "Why don't we race this thing?" He said, "Well, you get a motor and you fix the car, we go race it." So that's what we did. I mean, that car needed so much work. They had it cheated up with holes everywhere, and they had to patch all the holes. And uh, Rick Hendrick actually was kind enough to give me a a motor to race. So I put this thing together, and we went to Rockingham. And, of course, I'd never raced anything like Rockingham. And back then, it was no rules about where you could race first. So I had Jeff take the car out first, and he went out there, and he was third fastest. I was like, holy cow. God, if I did a good no job pressure. here, yeah. no pressure. So I climb in it, and like the fourth lap, I come off a two, I lost it, and I slapped the inside wall. <laughs> Didn't hurt it really bad, but it was bad enough where it was like, that's, we're done. Yeah. So I took it back, fixed it all, got it all back running again, and Rick let me keep the motor, and we went to Martinsville, and I can't remember. We qualified like 28th or something, 25th, and... The thing started overheating in the race, so I didn't didn't want to blow it up. So we pulled it in. But yeah, that was my first deal. So I worked for Tiger. From Tigers, I went to to uh, Buck Baker Driving School. Really? I didn't yeah. know you did that. Yeah, worked for Buck. Um, Buck as was, an instructor, or, or no? It was a fabricator. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, I no instructor at that point. I still have to this point in my life. I probably have forty starts in my whole life. You know, most of them are 25 lap features. Yeah. So I, I don't have any experience. <laughs> but no, I went there as a fabricator, fixing the the school cars and just anything we needed. And uh, we took in a job to for to put a body on a real race car because I had fixed everything, had needed some work. And so we took it in. It was Billy Standridge's car. It was a Nova. Built this beautiful body on this thing, and I, and I knew how to build the bodies from working at Hendrick with Robert G and on the sportsman cars, and I understood it from being around it. And I was a fabricator; I paid attention to stuff. So we built this beautiful car, and we went to Charlotte, qualified 16th. Billy wasn't supposed to do that. Uh, kind of a cool side story: Robert Black was the the director at the time. Oh, I love Robert Black. And stories. after qualifying, <laughs> yeah, and after qualifying. Robert made all, I found this out like three or four years later. I didn't know it at the time. But after the garage closed, he made all the inspectors stay. And when everybody was gone, they went over and took the car cover off our car. And he had all the inspectors go th- over our car and find out why we qualified 16th. With nobody there? With nobody there. Wow. Yeah. Because we weren't supposed to. Billy yeah. Standards yeah. wasn't supposed to be that fast. And we had a 311 would would carry an extra weight when everybody had V6s, you know, so it was like, it was pretty cool. So did he find anything? No, no, we were straight up legal, man. We just, I just happened to hit the setup really good, and Billy was, we were pretty decent in practice. We were like 20th in practice, and Billy just got a really good lap, and we qualified 16th. It was really cool. 
Um, and from there, I built Billy another brand new car that we took to Martinsville. Now, this was a V6 short track Pontiac. I mean, a really nice car. And while we were there, Bobby Hillen was walking around. And he didn't know who I was. And he came over and he was looking at our car. And he said, man, this is a really nice car. Who built it? I said, well, I, I built it. He said, man, this is really nice. Nice work, beautiful car. Yeah, yeah, and we talked for a while. Good job. And he left. Well, when he left, he went over to the cup side and was standing there talking to my brother Brett, telling him how he's going to start this bush team and he needs to get some fabricators and he needs to find a good one. And uh, he was telling Brett about this this pink car that he was looking at <laughs> on the other side and how beautiful it was. He said, well, that, my brother just built that car. And Bobby immediately come right back over. He said, hey, come here. I want to talk to you. So I was the first employee for Highline Racing, which was Bobby Hillen, Felix Sabatis, and Ted Condor. So I was Felix Sabatis' first employee in racing. <laughs> it was awesome. And that was, uh, that was kind of my big break right there. Yeah. You did wind up running eight bush races in 90 for Highline. Was that part of the deal when you first started with them, or did that just evolve? <laughs> that evolved. That's a funny story. So now Bobby had left the team and sold everything to Ted and Felix, and, of course, at this time Felix had started the cup team. Kyle was driving for him, Petty. And Kyle was driving our bush car with Ames as a sponsor. And... Ames wanted to run eight more races or seven more races. And Kyle being Kyle was like, man, I don't want to run seven more races. You know, most guys will jump at the chance yeah, to race. Yeah, yeah. Kyle's like, I don't want to do that. I, this is enough, 13 or whatever it was he was racing. He, we're standing in the shop talking about it. He just points over. He says, let Todd drive him. And now at this point, I'd already run some races at Charlotte in the sportsman car, sportsman yeah, series. Yeah. Ran four races and uh, finished second three times. Never got the win one. So he says, let Todd drive it. I'm like, yeah, heck yeah, let me drive it. I'll be all in, right? So they called Ames. Ames was a New York company. I was a New York boy. They loved the tie, so I got to race those, those races in that car, and we did pretty good. You know, my first race was Martinsville. Um, finished eighth. I was running fifth on, a, like, four laps to go. We had to restart, and I missed a shift. So we ended up eighth, and we went to Dover. First time in any kind of speedway like Dover. Now, you got to remember, uh, I'd been to all these tracks as a crew member and setup guy. I did all the setups for, for Kyle and Bobby and, the, and changed tires on pit road. So I'd been there and I'd watched races there. So I knew how to race these tracks. And now I just, when I got the opportunity, I just had to relate it to what I knew and go out and do it. So we went to Dover and qualified fourth and finished third, my first race at Dover. And because of that race, Frank Cece and Scott Welliver, who are from my hometown in New York in Elmira, they, they took notice to what I was doing, Frank Cece in particular. And that winter, they came south, they flew south to interview a driver, won't say his name, had hair down below his shoulders and had his own sponsor, and that's what they liked. Well, they interviewed this guy. They went to dinner with him or met him somewhere and got done with the interview. And Scott told Frank, like, there ain't no way we can have this guy drive for us. First of all, he was a little crazy. <laughs> so now they got, they got four hours before they have to go catch their flight to go back to New York. And Scott said, what do we do? And Frank said, well, let's call Todd and just talk to him. So they did. We met at a steakhouse in Charlotte and shook hands, and they hired me to drive their car for 1991 season. And that was my first time as a professional race car driver. Now, had you known Frank before that? Or? A little bit. Okay. Not, not really a lot, but a little bit. Um, and Scott Welliver was actually Jeff's roommate in college for a while. I did not yeah. really. Mm-hmm. I did not know that. Yeah, so they he yeah. knew Jeff, and Scott was a racer. He loved racing. Um, and for them to get Jeff's little brother, to get a hometown guy, it was all kind of synergy for them. And yeah. it was, yeah. was going to be fun, and it was. We had a blast. 
and we went out in our Dover was about the 10th, 11th, 12th race that year, and we won our first race. I, that was my next question. Dover, 1991, um, I think you're running third. Ernie Irvin blows an yeah. engine with four laps to go, and then Davey takes the lead, but yeah. then Davey can't get all the gas in his fuel cell to the pickups, and he stalls. Where did he stop? Did he stall coming to the white flag or yes, the checker? Yes, sir. No, he come. So we're we're on the line. It's going to end under caution. And I'm sick as a dog. I got food poisoning. So I raced I this. I knew there was something going on. I raced you. the race with food poisoning. I mean, I was sick. Holy cow. So we're coming off a of four. And the flagger's got the white flag. And he's, you know, he's waving the white flag. Going to under, under caution. End under caution. And baby, Davey goes down to the bottom of the track. And I'm thinking behind him, well, maybe there's something in the track. So I follow him down. The whole field kind of comes down behind us. Pretty soon I look around behind Davey, and the pace car is like way up there. And Davey's about stopped. So I pulled out and passed him. I took the white flag as the leader of the race, came back around and got the checkered. So it, ended, so it did end under caution. Ended under caution. Okay, all right, okay. Yeah. And Jeff Gordon was second. Can't remember who ended up third. Yeah. Now, how did how did you get food poisoning? What what happened? <laughs> One of my favorite Italian restaurants that I've gone to for years at Dover. Uh, I still went there even after because it's just a great place. Just had yeah. to be one of those yeah. things that happen. Yeah. I must have had something bad that night. I mean, the next morning I got up and I was sick. There is there is no there is no kind of sick like food poisoning. Oh, no. How did you run the race? Much less win. <clears throat> well. People don't realize and uh, racing and driving a race car is the one sport that takes nonstop concentration. Yeah. You, you cannot not concentrate because if you do, you get hurt. Yeah. You know, baseball, you know, you concentrate and when the pitcher gets ready for his windup, everybody's ready and concentrating, swing, miss. Okay, everybody relaxes. You know, uh, football, you get up there and you have a play and you concentrate and you do your play, play's over, you relax, you walk back to the huddle, you wait for the next play. There's always a, a period where you can relax your concentration. Racing isn't. You can't do it. Every lap, every straightaway, every corner, the only time you get any kind of break is a caution. So when you're concentrating on about what you're doing, you don't think about being sick. It's like guys racing with broke ribs. When you're racing, you don't even feel it. And not until the caution comes out and you relax and mm. you're like, oh man, yeah, it hurts, you know. And so it's you just do it. You just get out there and do it. So how big a deal was it for you to win that race personally? That first bush race. Um, uh, it it was a big deal because at that particular moment, uh, they had begun talks with the Pillsbury con company and Hungry Jack brand. So for that to happen, it couldn't have been any better timing. And we went three, four more weeks, and we went to Indianapolis Raceway Park with our first race as the Hungry Jack on the side of the car. We had them the rest of that year and the next year. So that, that took the team um, from just two guys owning a race car to now we're a professional race team. And that was the start of what turned out to be a long run for CC Weller Racing. I uh, ended up having a beautiful shop and three cars and all sponsored, and it was a real race team. And I'm really proud that I had a lot to do with that. 1992 at Daytona, you were involved in that big crash where uh, Joe Namachek's car, Joe Namachek's car uh, burst out in flames, and you and Bobby Labonte actually helped him out of it. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about that? Well, um, Joe and Andrea had become friends of my wife's and my, myself. Hmm. And so, you know, it's not often that you, and I, and I never did, I never tried to be friends with my competitors because it, it just always adds a whole other dyna dynamic when you're on a racetrack that I didn't want to have to deal with. But we had become friends, and 
I remember, you know, the big wreck and spinning, and, and my car was hurt. And I looked over. We're, we're all in laying in the infield off of turn two, and I remember seeing Joe's car on fire. I don't know why. I just jumped out and ran over there, and I got there and got the window net down, and Bobby come running up at that time. And I remember looking in the driver's compartment, standing at the window, and I couldn't see Joe because it was smoke was that thick. Mm. And at that point, I knew he was in trouble. You just, what are you breathing but smoke? That's not good. Well, big flame burst come from under the car, and Bobby kind of ran the other way, and I stood there. Still had my helmet on, so we were all protected. And I, I reached in, and I felt for his buckle, and I unbuckled him. And it now the smoke kind of, I guess the wind went the other direction, and now I could kind of see him in there, and he was slumped over. And I just I grabbed him by the suit and got him up, kind of got under his shoulder and pulled him up and sat him on the door ledge and then grabbed him again and pulled him out. And, you know, now I'm out of breath just from working so hard and running over there. I had to run probably 50 yards to get to him. And I look around, and the paramedics are there, and they got him. And so I go over, and I'm looking at my car. I, I tell them, all right. I got back in my car, and I drove it in. I mean, I, I didn't even care how old the car was. I just got out and got Joe. So we, I don't know. We, I don't even remember if we kept racing or not. But we went to the hospital after the race. And, of course, he was grateful and everything. Thank you. And we kept a couple laughs. And he says, but I just got to tell you one thing. Next time something like that happens, don't set me on the door ledge. I said, what do you mean? Yeah. He said, I've got a strip burned across my butt from that door ledge. That's how hot the door ledge was. It burned him through the fire suit, through his underwear, onto his bum. I mean, and I didn't even think about it at the time. That's because it was a big fire. It was yeah. pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. Bristol night race that same year, 1992, you're running Jeff Burton down for the lead and um, you wind up getting into him a little bit coming off turn two, I think it was. Um, you go on to win the race. What, what do you remember about <laughs> how all that went down? Hey it's man, funny. I dig deep. Hey, you, you I dig deep. I, 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 I dig one. deep. So, and I ain't finished yet either. So, <laughs> so back then, uh, well, first I get out in victory lane, and the crowd booed me like I had just shot the president and the pope. It didn't matter. I mean, I was the worst person in the world at that moment. And I'm like, what? I didn't do anything that bad. I mean, I moved him. He moved me to pass me, and I moved him to pass him back. And come to find out, I didn't know it at the time, but that was back when Winston had yes. the trailer, yep. the fifth-wheel yep. trailer, with the big bull, the <laughs> sign billboard on it, and they had hired a new guy to run it that week. And I heard this whole story from, yeah. um, oh, what was the guy that ran Winston at the T. time? T. Wayne T. Robinson. Wayne. Yeah. I've, I heard the whole story from T. Wayne a couple years later, actually. And they had hired a new guy to run that thing that week. And they told the guy, he wanted to know what he was supposed to do. And he, they told him, well, just react with the fans and what's on the track and, you know, just kind of go with the flow. Well, what he heard was a couple pe people booing me in turn one. So he puts up on the sign, they rolled across and scrolled, and said, Boo Bodine. Boo Bodine. So the, grands, <laughs> the grandstands went nuts and booed the heck out of me, which – I was kind of used to it because I've heard Jeff get booed like that before for yeah. no reason. So, yeah, but that's, that's that's what that was all about. So you did not actually see the the sign. I never got to see it. No, okay. I, I heard about it because at the time I'm up trying to celebrate and getting pictures and all this, and I'm like, man, what is going on? This is crazy. Sound like I was Kyle Bush. <laughs> <laughs> you said that I didn't. Um, the next week. In Winston Cup scene, uh, T. Wayne actually wrote a letter to the editor and apologized and 
said that the situation had been rectified or however he put it. Um, how, did, did he apologize to you or did you just find out about it later? Uh, I don't really remember. Okay, I, I right. knowing T Wayne, I'm I'm sure he come up and say, "Look, man, we're sorry about that." You know, that's how like that's the kind of guy he was. Um, yeah, I'd, okay. I don't right. really remember because it was one of those things too that I, I as a racer you get used to things like that happening and you just let it roll off your back and you just move on. 